Good evening. Welcome to the Earnings Review, your tidbits into company financials and operational insights. Thank you for joining us as we broadcast from the Hampton Studios in Harare, Zimbabwe. I'm Ibn Mabunda, yo money man. On the show, we engage top echelon executives to get you up to speed with first-hand information. We also chat with the most competent analysts on the market just to ensure you're finished with relevant and comprehensive market analysis. Tonight, we focus on OK Zimbabwe, a leading retailer with a significant footprint across Zimbabwe. On to some details where the group is concerned. The group is a supermarket retailer whose business focuses on three main categories, which are groceries, houseware, plus textiles, as well as basic clothing. Follow me as I take you on a jog down memory lane to get you up to speed with how the group has come to be. In 1942, the first retail outlet was opened in First Street in the then Salisbury. A decade later, another unit was opened in Bulawayo. A key development occurred in 1953 as the retailer was incorporated as the spring master. In 1960, the group had expanded its footprint by adding five additional retail outlets. In 1977, Delta Corporation acquired a controlling stake in the retailer before a subsequent name change into Trade in 1984. A vital development also occurred in the year 2001 as this saw the adoption of a new name, OK Stores, a brand established in 1929 by two South African entrepreneurs. That same year, this retailer was demerged from Delta with a subsequent listing on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. Fast forward to 2020, the group now boasts of 65 outlets spread across Zimbabwe. Some teensy weensies where the operations of the group are concerned. The group operates through three main brands, which are the OK Stores, Bon Marche, as well as OK Mart. This allows OK Zimbabwe to cater for different segments of the market from the lower end, moving right up to the higher end of the market peddling agenda of the group in as far as the affluent of the country. The group runs through Bon Marche, which has eight units spread across the affluent suburbs of Harare. Okay, Mart caters for retail outlets in Zimbabwe as it has six outlets spread across the country. The flagship OK stores caters for the lower end of the market and boasts of 50 outlets spread across Zimbabwe. And of course, the OK stores is known for its iconic promotion known as the OK Grand Challenge, arguably one of the biggest in Southern Africa. Some vital stats where the group is concerned with the current share price of 536 cents. The group has a market capitalization of 6.4 billion Zimbabwean dollars. Its share price has moved 800% since the year started vis-a-vis -a, -vis a consumer staples index, which has moved 536%. Comparatively, the ZSE All Share has mounted 621% over the very same period. Its major shareholders include the NASA, which has an 18% stake, as well as the Old Mutual Life Assurance, which has a 17% stake. The group opened the OK Online platform in November of 2019 in a bid to provide convenience to its clientele. This, of course, has come in handy in the face of the pandemic. Of note as well is the fact that OK opened another unit in Karoi in March of 2020, this making the tally to 65. The group recently refurbished four of its outlets in Triangle, Westgate, Gweru, as well as Mutare. Now, this concludes the Tinsi Winsi section of our show. In just a moment, we will have a look at the earlier conversation we had with the group chief executive, Mr. Alex Siaboro. Now, don't go anywhere. Good day, Alex, and thank you for joining us on the Earnings Review. Thank you, Equitaxis, for inviting me. Beautiful. As an icebreaker, how are you faring with the COVID? COVID is a challenge for everyone, but we continued operating because we classified as an essential service. 
But in that process, our hours of operating were reduced from your usual nine, ten hours, down to six. Twelve hours down to six. So that affected uh, our, our offtake, obviously. But the, the, the next installment of the lockdown relaxed the hours a bit. And we started to see increasing activity. But we still managed, uh, even during the tight lockdown period in April, we still managed to trade above break-even. We managed to cover all our costs and post a profit. And as well, where that is concerned, the pandemic, um, with the cancellation or the deferment of um, the OK Grand Challenge, how much of an impact would that have in terms of your sales? Oh, that would have a big impact because the Grand Challenge uh, was no longer just a promotion, if you remember. It had become a brand, essentially. Correct. And all suppliers were looking forward to it. Everyone prepares for it. Each time we concluded the Grand Challenge, people would be registering for the next one. So the, we... we it was a disadvantage for us to not to be able to run it. Yes, there were product limitations, but we were still going to attract more volume than we did during this time. Fair enough. Now, this conversation is coming fresh after the release of your um, most recent results and, of course, a trading update. Just in a nutshell, can you shed light in terms of some of the key developments and as far as your results are concerned? Well, the, the results, naturally, in the hyperinflation environment we're in, what is clear is that the the volume has retreated. We came under what we achieved last year by some 15.7 percent. It's in our report. But when you, when you check uh, the companies that have published within our jurisdiction, a lot of them have been reporting reduced volumes as well. So our, our performance would suggest a general trend in the economy, which is that of decline. But that does not mean we will stop wanting to increase our share. We'll try and take more share from our competitors. Faith. Even in that even in that declining environment. Fair enough. It's, it's pretty much across the sector and across the board as well. Uh, but let's talk about your um, overheads, which increased 427% in, in line with, with the inflation. What influenced that? The big factor was the cost of power. Last year, most of 2019, if you remember, there was no electricity on the grid. We were largely on alternative power, which is generator power. Now, generators consume fuel, particularly if they were running for as long as they did. And as the more you use the generators, because remember, the generators we have generally in the country would have been standby power and not main sources of generating power. So that meant with extended use, more intensive use, you also needed to repair the generators that much more frequently. So that was the biggest push on the cost to operate. Fair enough. Now to talk about um, the raging inflation that is characterizing um, our economy. How are you managing your debtors so as to limit exposure on that front? 
fortunately we we moved out of fashion furniture business a while ago that's where we used to carry a data's book we currently are just trading cash really so we don't do not have data that would affect loss of value in that respect fair enough and uh, what is your internal inflation and how are you navigating that turbulence and as far as inflation is concerned we, we do track our own internal inflation um, measuring it at point of procurement uh, we came out in, in average terms above 600 percent per annum average that's 12, 12 months average the earlier part of the year so lower levels of inflation but as the exchange rate ran away towards the end of the financial year we saw inflation galloping away at the point of procurement but the average came out at 630 something percent fair enough now um, can you shed light in terms of the recent refurbishment exercise that um, okay zimbabwe has undertaken it is um, a, a, a key to our business to keep our facilities refreshed improved good ambience for our customers last year we did some refurbishments we completed four stores uh, we carried over into this year two stores that was beginning to be a result of the you know in in march the covid story was settling in already but that is a key uh, activity which we will get back to as soon as things settle down and it's it's a it's a profitable investment because each time we do a store we see a rebound in sales an increase in sales and in in, in situations where we manage to expand the facility the space bring up, brings us uh, out a commensurate return in sales and profit fair enough and given the growing competition from wholesalers as well as other players coming on to um, your very sector how else are you consolidating your presence on the market well you you start with uh, the strength of the brand our brands are quite established and then they and they've got a good following and then you do what customers expect meeting their expectations in terms of service is difficult yes but you also have to find product you must be in product all the time as much as you can no, no matter how difficult it is you must be in product so that you are reliable to your customers okay and um, how are you faring on the financial services offering particularly where the money wave is concerned the money wave um, that has got many facets to it it was it, it handles remittances inbound it that, that that is now uh dealing with mukuru dealing with your uh, world remit dealing with your kawena but during the covid those inbound remittances slowed down that uh, you i think we can ascribe to the fact that the whole world was on lockdown in march and april 
so that interfered with uh, what we saw coming through as remittances. But there are other service offering in, 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 in offerings in the money wave. We do bill payments, we do insurance, uh, we do car licenses. So it's it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a diverse offering which is growing with lots of scope, it is contributing. Fair enough. And you rightly mentioned Kawena. How are you consolidating your presence in that, uh, in, in that sphere? I think that there is growing competition there from the likes of uh, Malaycha and, and several other players in that regard. What growth prospects exist for OK Zimbabwe? That one, it, it's, it's, it's not at the, the, the peak which it reached about three years ago. Uh, and the reason it, it, it went down was not because of the competition. It went down because of the shortage of cash in our market. Because the way the mechanism works is that the Kawena guys in South Africa would pick deposits from Zimbabweans who want to send money home. So instead of sending money, they would deposit money with our partners, Kawena. We would get notification of the value through our systems. And the same day or the following day or the day after, at the convenience of the beneficiary, they would come in, in store and buy some items and get a bit of cash. On the other side, on the, on the Kawena side, Kawena would accumulate balances and we tell them what to buy, which became the stock we would lend here for, for purchasing by the either our ordinary customer or the Kawena beneficiary by coming in store to buy. So it was it was a beautiful arrangement that way. I realize. And um, are there any prospects of that actually changing I, because i think there is a, a bit of potential where that market is concerned we're saying new we're seeing new players come onto the market who do not have a, as as wide a footprint as you have but they seem to be making progress in that regard do, do you have any strategies uh, and stratagems in place to consolidate your presence there we we are uh, on a on a on a campaign with 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 Kawena, uh, we we actually ran a promotional campaign uh, not so long ago. I can't remember the exact dates, and the response is is pleasing. Uh, you talk of uh, people like Malaysia. I think developments in that area will slow them down because. Uh, Groceries coming in are going to get dutiable, according to announcements by the Zimura officials, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I, I might need to fact check that. But I, I think it's going to, 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 inf to affect uh, Malaysia as well. I realize. And um, as we get close to wrapping it up, um, you recently declared a dividend, putting uh, smiles on the faces of your shareholders. Um, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, um, where does that put the business, given the uncertainty is presented by, by the COVID? Okay, the, let's start with the, with the payment. When we went to market, uh, with the prospectus back in 2001, we promised investors that would pay 
a dividend twice cover. And we have done that consistently out of profits whenever we had a good, good years. After dollarization, I think we only didn't pay a dividend in one year. So our, our, our investors expect a dividend. And how much dividend did we pay? This time we could, we could not pay the full dividend of price cover because we assessed the needs of the business and realized that we could not pay the twice cover. <clears throat> so we reduced the amount of dividend which we paid. And in as far as how it affects the business, it, 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 it is not affecting the business negatively. As it turns out, um, a lot of the customers who are actually shareholders as well, because when we listed the company, we, we wanted the ordinary shopper to own a share in the company, in their company. Which is the reason why, if you check our register at the moment, it has got something like 28,000 or 29,000 shareholders. This is the biggest, I think. Okay. It is those people that put in the money who are happy to receive the dividend and who are happy to come and buy using the dividend they receive in our shop. You then, you then look at uh, your shareholder like NASA. NASA will need liquidity by the nature of what they do. There is, there, 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 there is a social security authority who has got pensioners on their book. So their motivation in, 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 in investing in us would have been our promise to pay a dividend. So yes, we, did, we could not pay the, the full dividend because we wanted to leave some of the money in the business given the conditions of COVID, but we gave them something to make it easy for the pensioner and for them who are administering the pensions. And indeed, you've been true to your word. Well, um, thank you so much, Alex, for making the time to be with us on uh, the Earnings Review. Thank you very much for inviting me, Ebit Axis. Beautiful, and good luck with the ensuing financial season. Thank you. Talk to you later. Ciao. Welcome back, viewers. That was, of course, Mr. Alex Yavora, the chief executive for K-Zimbabwe, shedding light on the performance of the entity and giving us insight into their operations. And now joining me for an analysis of the firm is our very own in-house analyst, Respect Gwenzi. Respect, good evening and thank you for joining us on the Earnings Review. It's always my pleasure, Ibn. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, I want us to touch just a little bit on the financials and um, your assessment of uh, the operations of, of OK Zimbabwe, given the macroeconomic environment that uh, OK Zimbabwe finds itself in, uh, deep in terms of their volumes um, as uh, economic demand uh, gets to be depressed in the economy. What is your assessment of their operations in that regard? Uh, the 2020 performance obviously has been shaped by broader macroeconomic uh, conditions. Looking on the background, if you try to project a year from 20, 2009 onwards, revenue has been scaling up year on year. But now getting into 2020, of course, you're seeing inflation adjusted uh, income scaling up. But in real terms, uh, that obviously is a dip on the prior year. Uh, which is mainly an impact on of um, of uh, I mean uh, uh, demand which has been coming up. So a 23% decline in, in in volumes is really a reflection of uh, a 
slowdown in real earnings, which really is being driven by the aspect of value erosion coming to incomes. I think looking at inflation year on year, uh, as it uh, as it as it as it may, uh, the figures are upwards of um, seven hundred, and that's really worrying. And for OK, their own in-house internal inflation was upwards of six hundred percent. So you you obviously have to push that in terms of your pricing uh, for the for, for I mean in the ultimate product that you push to the market, and it has been very difficult for Zimbabweans to maintain. Uh, the same level of consumption which they were doing in prior years. I think looking at the broader uh, indicators such as GDP minus 10% for 2019, that really speaks to a slowdown in production, which really is emanating from the aspect of demand. So demand has been slowing down because people can no longer afford and uh, OK has not been spared. But uh, I think retail is uh, quite a diversified uh, you have a diversified range of products that you are offering to the market and therefore sometimes you get to be cushioned uh, because you have high value products, low value products, uh, value products, etc. So you, you get to be really cushioned unless you are possibly pushing a different set of retail, suppose it's apparel retail or maybe it's, 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 it's furniture. But for, for OK, generally theirs is uh, mainly groceries and uh, these really speak to different segments of the market but uh, people are slowly moving uh, they're, they're moving to value products and uh, i think they've also benefited uh, i mean given their value chain as well to be topical respect um, there is this 75 us dollar initiative that's been launched by government how will it affect um, retailers as well as the consumers on the other hand I'll start with the retailers. I think it's a reprieve to the civil servants looking at uh, how the cost of living has really been going up and looking at the average food basket and, and, and the costs uh, that are involved is upwards of 7,000 uh, presently. So I, I think uh, when you want to look at this in terms of the impact that it's going to have on the fiscus, it's also another subject. But let's look at the impact between retailer and the consumer um, on the side of retail you move into your shop with whatever uh, maybe it's going to be a card which you then use to buy your groceries but now that prices are going to be pegged in both local and, uh, and, and, and foreign currency it means if somebody picks their good in terms of uh, whatever uh, foreign price that's pegged on that on that uh, item, they take it to the till. Uh, it gets priced, or, or they get uh, they get uh, the the transaction is completed in USD terms. Now, at that point, you don't have to uh, apply a rate to it. You're simply doing a transaction based on a USD price. Deduct that USD equivalent from someone's cut. I think that the problem starts when you try to do a reconciliation between government settlement of these obligations because it's not like there is ready money that will be uh, immediately uh, uh, deducted from the treasury in real USD. At the point of purchase, you don't really have challenges because someone is simply paying and there's a deduction at the shop level. But now these funds get into an OK account, which is supposed to have some real dollars or to be funded in real dollars. And that's where government's involvement has to come in. So government has to settle this account. So assuming that government settles immediately that account or uh, on demand, it simply means there won't be any lag. But now knowing the challenges that we have as an economy and uh, knowing what government gets, if I'm to give you the actual figures, per annum we earn approximately 360 million to 400 million in terms of uh, government's taxes and royalties. I mean, net earnings in terms of foreign currency. 400 million. If you deduce that per month, it's roughly uh, around uh, 30 to 35 million. And when you look at this uh, introduced uh, $75 fee multiplied by a civil service base of about 300,000, that gives you really a total of about 300, close to 300. 1000 300 um, 300 million per annum also add that to what pensioners are going to be given as well which will still be in this voucher form 
that total is very very close to what government earns in terms of the annual flows of forex due to them in as, 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 as taxes so there's a tight uh, gap between what they earn and what they have promised the civil servants and the and the uh, the pensioners so in terms of payability or settlement of an account which is the account of the consumer or the account of the retailer now who has now taken something from uh, 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 the retail the, the 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 consumer that's where the challenge is so i don't believe that given this tight uh, uh, difference between what government ends and what they they have promised they will be able to settle on time and now what happens when government fails to settle the retailer's account on time i think that it gradually discounts that which is coming from this card system or this whole okay. uh, voucher system so i think there's gonna be a lag at the central bank again where government has to settle okay's account uh, with monies that are already overdue they will possibly be, 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 be a rate of sort emanating from that from that distinction so i think it destabilizes the retailer in that they would, won't be would, able would it to be similar to the whole legacy debt situation that we have seen earlier in a way uh, yeah but then this the legacy debt in terms of debt that's due to outside companies this is due to local companies but these local companies want to purchase from outside that's why what they want to use the 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 the, the us dollar for so the challenge now becomes now uh, starts where you want to procure something from outside or where you want to liquidate those USD funds in order for you to get something on the local platform. But on the local side, it's, it might be easier for government. Arab is it, if the money is not there in, 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 USD form, in, in USD form, they might simply create that money. Of course, they have promised not to. But I think there are those challenges in terms of replenishing the supplies due to failure by government to settle on time and this also emanates from the fact that we are not earning as much to easily settle this while covering other things such as fuel procurement etc so i see uh, that, uh, that 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 lag uh, causing a bit of supply gaps in the market traditionally i mean we've had um, okay stores and we've had spa TM, but uh, the matrix has shifted. Now we are seeing other players, wholesalers, gain cash and carry, also playing in the retail space. Um, how solid is their footprint and what can they do to consolidate their presence on the market? Yeah, I think retail is, uh, is, a, is a space which is quite fluid and there's also quite some intense competition in that sector right across the world. If you're looking from a disruptive point of view, there's been a lot of disruption coming from technology over the past few years. If you look at some of the retail giants globally at the present moment, uh, I think Walmart, they have been replaced by uh, Amazon and so forth. So I think digitalization has brought convenience to the customer and it really undercuts the traditional uh, uh, players in retail. And uh, looking on the local landscape, I think much of the pressure has been coming from um, wholesalers Particularly, these uh, uh, particular segment of players, they offer uh, uh, bulk goods at a cheaper price. And looking at the income levels of the country as a as a as a as a low income country, uh, it it really it really creates value for the consumer to be pushing money in those kind of um, I mean towards the direction of wholesalers. Why? Because they offer more for less. So I think that pressure. Uh, slow down in incomes it really pushes people to look for the highest value in products that's why we have seen this proliferation of uh, retailers but generally our country is also uh, basically a retail nation because we do less production and everyone is trying to get a bit of margin in terms of pushing one good to the other and that really also dents into if, if you look in recent periods people are doing uh, home deliveries for, for, for things like chicken and so forth and so forth. And now we also see the emergence of um, uh, some online retail and also some virtual retail such as um, Kuru. I think they opened something recently. 
and uh, also looking at um, so look the, the, the other players in that space who are Malaysia quite... Malaycha and, 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 and all yes, those. Yes, especially Malaycha, they have been quite dominant in that space uh, from the South African market and they've now gone international. So I think all that speaks to some of these um, Dynamics. forces in terms of uh, how the retail space is being disrupted and is also being impacted by these macroeconomic developments. So OK finds itself in that space and uh, what, what, what they have done as a company is to uh, leverage on their brand. I think uh, the OK brand is quite strong. It's one of the strongest retail brands in, in, in this country and they've leveraged on that. But in, in, I mean, in order for you to stay relevant, it also means you have to invest in, in, in your, in your uh, sprucing up uh, the, 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 the image of your company by definitely refurbishing your, 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 your branches. I mean, just to sort out the ambience of those, uh, of those uh, branches. So I think this has been their main advantage, being able to really offer a product which uh, resonates well with the customer in terms of the brand equity as well as the experience, the customer experience within the shops. Um, in terms of the brands, Bon Marche has a presence in Harare and they have um, eight branches. But beyond Harare, they seem not to, to have a, a presence there. What could be informing that? I think there's always a market study which should always inform the aspect of expansion in terms of the branch network. Um, I think looking at power speed, which is also another uh, retailer, but in a different space, they have a high concentration of, uh, I think over 60% of their shops are concentrated in Harare. And the same goes to say, why do you have, why don't you distribute accordingly? Uh, my view is always that uh, whenever such an evaluation has to be made, you're also looking at affordability, you're looking at uh, ability of people in a certain town to actually uh, buy your product. And looking at, uh, looking at OK in terms of Bon Marche, this is a premium brand. And when you look at what average incomes are earned in those smaller towns, it's, it's quite low. So you have Harare where you have most of the executives within different companies and top level managers of all the companies and people who are doing uh, better off ahead of any other town. So I think in terms of high concentration of high net worth individuals, Harare is probably 90 or 80 percent of all the high net worth uh, uh, people in this country. So that really justifies this aspect of uh, high concentration of, um, of these uh, bon marché, which are the premium uh, shops. Uh, run by OK. Well, thank you, Respect, for uh, taking the time to share your views. Thank you, viewers, for staying with us. Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and to visit our informative website, www.equityaccess.net. Remember to catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on this platform, 7 p.m. Central African time, from the Equity Access team and even your money man. Danke and ciao.